Well, thank you, thank you everyone. In particular, I think we have a nice WG audience here because this is truly a treasured opportunity to, uh, to have these three esteemed men here who were so, uh, uh, quite frankly, they were the source of WGU. Uh, whether it was vision or execution, uh, these three individuals to my right uh, really uh, helped create WGU. Uh, they formed it. They, the idea was uh, <coughs> manifested not only in articles of incorporation that also uh, brought together the partners of the 19 western states to provide seed capital to it. Uh, they were able to attract Bob Mendenhall, who is really in many ways the founding president because his uh, singular ability to actually see that vision and then the you know, executed path to it. And so it's truly a treasured opportunity to have these three here with us and kind of chat with them. And, and I'm just going to do my best to moderate uh, a, a conversation among these three because as you'll probably see pretty quickly, they'll start talking and I'll just try to <laughs> see if I can direct <laughs> that conversation where, where we may want to learn a little bit more about, uh, about different things. Uh, but uh, for those of you who don't know uh, WG's history, uh, nearly 25 years ago now, next year actually we'll be so celebrating WG's 25th anniversary. Um, we, did, we researched this again because we have a number of events planned for next year, but the memorandum, memorandum of understanding was signed on January 15, 1997. And so we're, uh, we're going to use that as a key event to kick off a year of uh, celebration of WGU. But it was really founded by, uh, by governors of 19 western states and territories, but in reality, uh, that vision originated with our two governors here to my right, Governor Mike Levitt from Utah and Governor Roy Romer from Colorado. And uh, personally for me, having been with those two uh, in several different uh, cases, it's just been so fun to watch the uh, exchange start to happen between those two as they reminisce about what it was like uh, at that time period. I'm working on a number <coughs> of different things uh, that they worked on. And certainly WGU is one of those uh, true remarkable impacts that they had, but uh, they did remind me that it wasn't the only thing that they did together. And so we'll talk, a, <laughs> they, we'll talk a little bit about how they were able to see across party lines and, uh, and convene uh, many from different perspectives and backgrounds around this uh, core uh, belief that they had in how education can change people's lives. It was evident that uh, trying to change the existing higher <clears throat> education um, industry would be very difficult. And we concluded it was a, it was a time when uh, Clayton Christensen's book, The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, was uh, first uh, coming onto the scene. And so this idea that you need, need, need to actually reinvent by creating something that would disrupt and uh, we, we had a, I'll just, I, I went to a governor's conference with the Western governors, happened to be in Park City. We had a governor's only meeting every year where the governors would sit around and just say, this is what's worrying me. Uh, it was raised at the table, higher ed is worrying me, am I the only one? And Roy jumped in and said, no, uh, you're not the only one. And we had a conversation that literally led that, in the course of that, that meeting, uh, to the idea being framed up. And we agreed that we would have a meet the next time we met, which was going to be in Las Vegas, that we would uh, try to move a, a plan forward that could begin to frame up what WGU would look like. I knew people who graduated with me who had more talent than I had, and they never got a chance at it. So all my life, I have been interested in opening those doors and giving opportunity to people who, 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 who weren't blessed like I was. And um, WGU brings that, that opportunity to them. It brings it at a cost and at a quality, which is just, uh, in my judgment, it's one of the more important things I have been involved with. My particular contribution when we and Mike got together, he was into technology. I was into competence. I, I'm a pilot. And you know, it doesn't care, you don't care how long you sit in the damn seat. It's whether you can land the plane. You know, it's whether you can perform what you know. I just thought we did education the wrong way. We, we know that students 
come to education knowing different things and they learn at different rates, but we stick them all in a classroom and we have them sit there for the same length of time and listen to the same stuff and some of them already knew it all and are wasting their time and others need to go slower and never learn what they're supposed to learn and technology just has this power to individualize it to individual mm -hmm. students and you know I started in this before there were PCs and we didn't really have computers that could make it happen and finally now we're at a point where computers can really make a difference. We flew out on the state plane and we had this conversation all the way out about his vision and Roy's vision and what WG could become. And then we walk into this room and there's like, I don't know, six or eight governors and six or eight CEOs of companies. Eric Schmidt, who was then at Novell, and Scott McNeely and a number of others. And all these governors and corporate chieftains were behind this and pledged their support. And my feeling was this, this is a chance to ultimately implement what I'd been trying to do for 20 years already, which is get technology and education integrated to really provide a better experience for students and particularly to serve underserved students. Um, and with the support, like I saw in that meeting, I was like, we can make this we can make this work. We just kept moving forward and kept, and it was ba based on the, some very basic principles. It was true that technology would take information to where people were and not have to go to a campus. It was true that competency was a better measure than seat time. It was true that the system needed to be rethought. And those, those basic principles just kept us moving forward. And I'm sure at some point, the fear of embarrassment played in there too, uh, as it always does. We just needed to keep going because what we were doing was right. This organization could have failed at any of 25 times. And somehow it just continued to move forward. I think of Jenny. We needed a student. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a key ingredient. <laughs> I mean, this, think about this. You're asking someone to subscribe to a master's degree at a university that's not accredited, uh, and for which there's, you're the only student, <laughs> or one of the few. That takes, that's, that's pioneering in any in any uh, form of the definition. And w, the WGU story isn't one story. It's a hundred different stories all converging around three basic principles. And somehow, at the end of the day, it began to gather a sense of continuity. That, look, the mission drifted from here. I mean, it, we were going to be this, and then we were going to be this, and then we were going to be this, and this is, but ultimately, it was those three principles that 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 drove this. Uh, as I've seen the impact of student debt uh, and the accessibility barrier that cost is. I, 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 first, I, when I read your annual report, the first thing I looked to was the quality because that I wanted to be sure you're maintaining. But the impact of that cost, I think eventually is going to be dramatic in America. Somebody need to demonstrate this can be done. We still got some very inefficient and expensive higher education out there. It isn't worth what people are paying for it. And so I like that example. And I believe that the lasting innovation of WGU is that it was in value was introduced to higher education through the delivery of high quality in a scalable way. We didn't start off just to do WGU by the way. We believed that if we could demonstrate it at WGU ultimately others in higher education would begin to emulate it. And it's taken 25 years, but I don't know if you see it yet, but I do. 
there are a lot of people beginning to say, what is it about what's going on there that allows them to be sustainable? And I, I think that's going to be ultimately the great success of this mission, is that we didn't just form a great institution, we began to plant the seeds of transformation in an entire sector. And we served people who had generally some college and no degree and without WDU probably wouldn't have gotten a degree. And I think it's generational. It's, it's going to impact not only them but their children and their grandchildren. Um, the impact of education on a single life, much less a couple hundred thousand lives, yeah. is, is dramatic. And I think th that's an impact that we all focused on as we worked and what really kept us together on, on this mission of impacting lives and making a difference. People just don't want to sit in a classroom for years learning at the same pace as everyone else when they're all learning at a different pace. We don't learn at the same pace and we don't know the same things. I hope that all of you feel encouraged that there still is the belief that we have at WGU and it's, it's, we, it's our first and most important culture belief in many ways and it's simply one by one. That we solve for the individual student and we advance outcomes one student at a time. And that's so different when you think about it even when we have 130,000 currently enrolled students, when you have 250,000 graduates. Because, uh, because whether it was Jenny, who as the only student at a time, that's redefining definitely personalized learning, but, uh, <laughs> or whether it's today 130,000, it's actually 130,000 individuals. And each of them are having an individual experience through their, through their WGU life. And we even recognize here that as much as we may have even, not by purpose, we may have standardized certain things that are not working for certain individuals. And because of that belief on that one by one, we're willing to disrupt even the way we're doing things so that it works for more and more individuals so it can ultimately result in that outcome.